Hey, what up, family? Tim Castleman here with another edition of the Two Drink Tim podcast. And I know, I know, I know this episode is late. And I have a very important and good reason for it being late. You see, normally I record these either late Sunday or early Monday and then release them on Mondays. This week's episode obviously is being recorded in the middle of the week. And truthfully, it's only be re- being recorded because we got several emails and people posting on Facebook like, hey, where the hell's my podcast, Tim? Well, let me explain to you people what happened. You see, my wife is in the middle of this two-year in, uh, project. Actually, she's not in the middle. She's at the end. It actually ends Friday. Okay? But she has been out in California for the last three weeks, which means I have not seen my wife the entire month of June 2014. So she calls me last week and she's like, hey, I really miss your ugly face and I'd like to see you for a little bit. And I'm like, sounds good. What do you got in mind? She said, how about I fly in for 48 hours, we hang out, have a good time, then you take me to the airport. And I'm like, sounds good. You know, I'll put the Game of Thrones marathon, the Scrabble puzzles, I'll put it all on pause for you, baby. You first, right? Because we're committed. So... She flies in Friday, we get to hang out Saturday, Sunday, and then I got to wake my ass up at oh dark 30, like 4.30 in the morning on Monday morning, and drive her to the airport. At least I think I drove her to the airport because I did it with my eyes closed because I was still sleeping because who the fuck gets up at 4.30 in the morning, a.m., willingly and consistently. So the reason, ladies and gentlemen, that the podcast was late is the fact that I had not seen my wife in three and a half weeks, and I was busy trying to make her pregnant. Okay, that's why. There you go. Open and honest, right? A lot of sexy time occasionally involving the two of us at the same time happened this weekend. I took some videos, right? Not going to release those because, you know, privacy, active and all that good stuff. So now my wife is in town. I got to spend it with her and really reconnect with her and just hang out and be like, hey, I remember what you look like. Hey, I remember what you look like. Let's be friends. So got to do that and enjoy my time. So I do apologize that the podcast is late. I I promise you that I had a good reason, and I thank you guys for holding me accountable because I do love doing these podcasts for you. One thing before we get into what I want to talk about today, um, and this kind of hit me by surprise this week. A good friend of mine, uh, Lisa G, uh, has been struggling lately, and uh, it's funny because I talked to her last week and just talked to her over Facebook, and you know there was nothing really that told me that something was, was going on to the degree that we later found out was. And bottom line, Lisa struggles from depression um, and has you know struggled with it most of her adult life, and has kind of had a relapse in that area that's caused her um, some severe financial difficulties. Um, but way beyond that, a tremendous emotional difficulties as well. Um, and bottom line is this, right? She needs our help. Uh, when I say our help, I'm actually putting my money where my mouth is, and I'll explain that to you in a minute. And what she's trying to do is raise enough money to take care of her family. She's got uh, a husband. Um, she's also got two kids, you know, and, and they're just not getting by. So she's doing kind of like a Kickstarter, if you will. Uh, but not really. I mean, it's just basically a please help me out for a pledge drive. And I read her letter and it's probably one of the most honest and real letters that I've ever read. And it has to be incredibly humbling to sit down and pour your soul out into a computer and say the things that she said. And I encourage you to read that letter because it is just, it's to the heart. And that letter spoke to me because as I've made no short mention on this podcast, you know, I struggle at times with depression. Uh, I definitely have worked on myself the most the last two years and it is, it has worked tremendously well. Um, but I also know how crippling, uh, some of the things that she is going through are for me, and I can't even imagine to experience them at a deeper level than she is. So here's what I've done. I have pledged to match all donations up to $1,000, which means I'm going to give her $1,000 because I want to help her out in this situation. So I am encouraging, nay, I'm requesting, begging, pleading, whatever you want to call it, if you're listening to this podcast, could you do me a favor? Could you go to timreallylikes.com slash Lisa? Again, timreallylikes.com slash Lisa and donate some money. It doesn't have to be a, a huge sum. It doesn't, I'm not, I'm not putting the thousand dollars out there for any other reason to just encourage donations. And I will match any and all podcast donations made up to that thousand dollar mark because I believe that if I was in that situation, 
that I would want some help and some guidance and some love and some understanding. You know, this weekend, uh, while my wife is in town, we went out to eat and some guy came up to me, you know, and this place is right next to a Walmart. I'm not bashing a Walmart. It just happened to be, you know, and he tells you that sob story, right? Well, my wife and I are broke down and here's what I'm trying to do. And I need $26 for a part and blah, blah. And before he could even finish his, his pre, I'm sure pre rehearsed speech, I gave him the money. Now, here's the thing. That guy could have gone, got beer. He could have got, gotten drugs. He could have done, you know, bought a whore. I mean, he could have done terrible things with that money. Or maybe that story was true and he really needed the money to get on home. I don't know. But here's what I know. If I was in that situation, I would want someone's love, compassion, and generosity. So that's why I gave to him and that's why I'm giving to Lisa. And my thoughts are with her and her family as she makes the long road to recovery. So if you've got a few extra dollars, even if you don't, if you could just find five, ten, whatever you got, she needs. And you can find out more and you can read her letter, whether you decide to donate or not, at timreallylikes.com slash Lisa. I get nothing from it. Even more, honestly, I hate talking about it because, you know, I posted on Facebook, I was matching the donations up to a thousand bucks. And everyone was like, oh, Tim, you're so awesome and you're so great and so wonderful. And while that may be true, right, there's a little ego play, right? It's not about me and I'm not doing this to shed light on me or have people think I'm so awesome and amazing. I'm doing it because I really want to spread the word and I really want to help her out of this dire time. And more importantly, I really am doing it right now because if I was ever in that situation, I too would want some love and generosity. So with that, let's talk about what I want to talk about this week. And that is the five things most people fuck up in their businesses. That's right. The five things most people are fucking up in their businesses. Subtitle, the five things I'm fucking up in my business. Because this is my personal list that I'm sharing with you from inside my business, explaining where I think I'm fucking up, where I'm not doing enough, where I need to be investing more time, money, resources, etc., etc. Now, let me frame this for you, okay? I am admitting this and I'm pouring my heart out to you and I'm sharing with you real raw and relevant because I want you to learn from it in your own business, in your own life. But understand that even though I'm about to tell you these five things that I don't think that I'm really good at and I need to improve upon, I've still been able to sell seven figures of information products, whether it's myself or affiliates, okay? I've still live a pretty awesome life and, and have a pretty uh, kick-ass lifestyle. So understand that it, you don't have to be perfect, and I'm never going to be perfect because I guarantee you when I cross one of these off the list, Another one's going to pop up. But these are the five things that I consider are most pressing in my business right now. So David Letterman style, right? I'm going to just start at the very beginning, even though I know David doesn't do it. I meant countdown time. Get off me. Okay, I'm still recovering from the lack of, of oxygen this weekend. You know what? You talk me into it. I'm going to do it David Letterman style. I'm going to start from the bottom and work my way up. All right. So number five is this. Number five is no systems in place. Here's what I mean by that. If I were to die tomorrow, there is no reference guide, there is no cheat sheet, there is nothing that is written that explains how I run my business, how I pick affiliate offers, how I send my emails, you know, how I record a webinar, do all that stuff. Now, there might be the occasional training video, but there's no central resource uh, on the subject. I don't have a website where I can just say, hey, here's all the 50 things that I do in my business. Here's a video of all 50. If you ever need it, go on and take it. So I'm relying on corporate memory and worse, I'm relying on my memory for a lot of that stuff. Here's the other thing. By, because I don't have a system, I'm always trying to reinvent the wheel. It's like, well, how do we do a sales page? Well, how do we do a sales funnel? Well, how, 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 how? And because I don't have that consistency of like, hey, every time we do this and every time we do this and every time we do that, right? Every time I'm, I'm forced to expand the mental and physical brain power right and try to recreate the wheel come up with everything remember it it's extremely stressful it's extremely annoying and i'm happy to report that we are working on it now here's what makes it very hard for me as an entrepreneur i do not find value in those things okay now hear me they are valuable they are necessary they should be done i should have them in my business unfortunately because i don't find value in it it's hard for me to push 
right, to make that happen. So what I ended up having to do is I actually tasked it to one of our assistants who has some project manager experience and basically said, figure out my business, figure out what the hell we do, and let's record it as best as possible. So while it may not be something that I ever use or frequently use, it will be something that will be there for future employees. The other thing, if you're super busy, <clears throat> lazy, like I am, what I would recommend you do is when you do something like set up a website, install Crazy Egg, whatever it is, whatever it is, do yourself a favor, fire up Camtasia or Screencast-O-Matic or whatever your favorite screen recording software is and just record the process and walk people through that. Then throw it up on YouTube or throw it up on a little WordPress page and bam, you have some corporate continuity. Noah Keegan talked about this in an uh, interview and it always stuck out me. It's like he has a death plan. Because God forbid something happens to any one of us, what happens to your business? For most people, if they go away, their business goes away. You know, my mom has a sewing repair and, and you know, sales shop. Unfortunately, I know nothing about that business. Sadly, if she were to pass suddenly, right, there would be a real problem because who the hell knows what to do and how to do and how, how to do anything other than go in, turn the lights on and survive. And if I were to record everything into a system and we were to get on a routine and use that system, that frees the brain power from having to think about, well, how do I set up a PayPal button or how do I set up a JVZoo button to, hmm, how do I want to grow and expand and build my business? You see, even though we were recording record profits and amazing sales for this year, to grow, we need to get better. What brought us to the dance is not going to take the girl home with us, right? We've arrived. Everybody's seen us. We're here. Now we got to change the game up. We got to switch some things up. Now I have to remain true to myself through this process and I have to, you know, understand my struggles. And it certainly doesn't mean that I want to become some huge conglomerate with, you know, 5,000 employees working 7,500 hours a week. Screw that. I have zero desire to do that. But what it does mean is somewhere between uh, writing it down on a piece of toilet paper and then flushing it and having, you know, a 700 page manual, I need to find something that works best for me. Bottom line is I need to make sure the major things are at least documented in some way because if something happens to me, uh, you know, a staff member, anything like that, I have to make sure that the business can carry on. All right. So put some systems, put some training in place in your business. Number four on the list is not consistently building JV relationships or relationships in general. The sad part about our business and really our life is we are becoming a more segmented society, right? What does that mean, Tim? Well, that means that we're stuck inside all, all the time. We rarely interact with others. Well, I, I mean, I live in a neighborhood. I don't even know my neighbors that well. I think I've shook hands with them one time when we moved in and that's it, right? And that sucks. Because if, I, if my house is ever on fire, they're not going to feel really compelled to come put it out from that guy that they met one time that does that weird internet thing, right? Well, the same thing is true in business. The fact of the matter is nobody gets anywhere alone. Your success or failure can be determined by the people that you associate with and that you work with, okay? I know we've all heard that self-cliche, you're the average of the five people that you hang around. Well, that's a real fucking problem if you don't have five people that you regularly hang around. Here's why else it's important to constantly be building relationships. Remember that first girl or guy that you dated? Did you marry them, right? Unless you're a freak like my wife, chances are no. Why? because things happened, the situations changed, the relationship evolved, maybe you grew out of that relationship, maybe you both have moved on happily or not happily from that relationship. Life changes, business changes, things change. The only cons constant in life is change. So if you don't prepare for it by constantly building, growing, scaling, and building relationships, then what happens is the same thing that happened to me which is we, you get a, a posse, a clique, your homeboys, La Familia, whatever, right? Of six or seven successful internet marketers. And then one day someone goes, you know what? I don't want to hang out with you guys anymore. I think I'm done, right? I think I'm gone. I'm out. And then another person leaves, another person leaves, another person leaves. And people spread. 
right? It's like going to college. Everybody thinks I'm going to be best friends with my people from college for life. How's that working for you? I only talked to one guy from college. Granted, he is my best friend, but still, out of all the people I met in college, there's only one relationship that survived. People change, situations change, time change. The people, right? The people that I grew up with in this business have gone on to do tremendous things, but I'm in the Kindle marketplace. Well, if you're in the WordPress plugin marketplace, we probably can't do business too much anymore, right? So always constantly evolve. And this is something I struggle with mightily for a couple of reasons, okay? Honest and truth telling time with, with uh, Uncle Tim. First of all, all right, I have the perception wrongly I believe but I have the perception of kind of being blunt and to the point and an asshole that makes it real leery for certain people to work with me like me and Ryan Dice we do the traffic and conversion things because he graciously allows me to and we're very thankful for that right but it's not like him and I are going to be on a sales page together being like hey Ryan go fuck yourself and he's like what I don't even do anything to deserve that okay um, so because of my personality and style, a lot of people will be friendly with me, but they're hesitant to recommend me. Now, this has changed uh, drastically over the last two years as I've kind of calmed down and understood a lot of where my anger has come from. Uh, and I, I've changed a lot of things, but the stigma still prevails. And that is the biggest thing that's, that uh, is huge for me, okay? Um, the other thing is we're really easy to get kind of niched and, you know, okay, I'm just going to kind of do my thing and forget the world and, and screw that. But here's the thing. What if that thing that you're doing now is, is probably not going to be that thing you're doing uh, six months from now or a year from now or two years from now? You always have to be making those connections and making those relationships. And the third part of that is you got to watch your ego. Okay. And this one is tough for me. Because we think, because we look through our filter, that what I do is the best, right? It's the best thing I do. I'm the best at it. And no one else can do a, it service, so on and so forth. You know, I, I'm not going to show other people stuff because there isn't as good as mine or whatever. That's really crippling. That's crippling to encouraging someone that's building up, okay? But that's also crippling to your relationships because nobody likes an asshole that's always like, you know, guys, uh, I think your shit sucks, but my stuff's amazing. And here, nobody likes that guy. Everyone's like, get that guy out of the party. So what you need to do is you need to find the people that you would like to associate with, get in front of them some way, somehow, and nurture that relationship. I'll tell you how I'm trying to do it because even five years in to this business, I'm struggling with it. Here's what I'm working on. I'm trying to reach out on a consistent basis. So three times a week, I'm trying to make a call to somebody in our industry. It can be an existing friend, it could be a new friend. And I'm trying to learn more about them and their business and take an active role. And I'm trying to serve first, sell second. So, you know, here's the thing. I get pitched all the time from JV people that want to be my new best friend as long as I send an email and then piss off, right? So when I go and I approach someone, I say, hey, listen, James Jones, for example. Dude, I just want to talk. I don't have anything to pitch or sell you. I just want to see how you're doing, man. I haven't heard from you in a little while. Or Brian Johnson. Hey, man, I just want to call, check on Otis, see what's up, see how life is. The key is to take an active involvement of, in them. Find out about them, their hobbies, their interests. Come in and find a way to promote them or help them first. And then when it's your turn, then you can ask for a favor. Don't abuse it, right? There's plenty of dickheads that I don't work with anymore. They're like, hey, man, I need a favor. Okay. Hey, man, I need another favor and another and another. And it's like, dude, how about you quit trying to have sex with my wife every week at, when I can only have sex with yours once in a lifetime? Okay, which is a totally horrible analogy, but you can blame that on the Dos Madres rum. Basically, try to keep it as even as possible. It's never going to be perfectly even, but as long as you try and as long as you willingly, uh, you know, generally care about that other person and want to serve them first and sell them second, I think you're going to find great success with it. So sit down, write a list and say, you know what, these are the top 10 people that I want to know. Okay, now, and I'm not saying this to brag because I'm terrible at this. I'm absolutely horrible 
at this, okay? But having joint venture partners or people in the business that got your back is immensely and can be immensely life-changing, all right? So I'm not bragging when I tell you that I talk to Frank Kern via email on a regular and frequent basis, okay? Uh, normally, it's me sending him a dick joke, him going, ha-ha, and, and that's the end of it. You know, if I needed some business advice, I'm sure he would give me a small smidgen before he's like, hey, you know what you should do is pay me, okay? But people on my level, above my level, I talk to them on a regular basis, or at least I do my best to, because I always want to know what they're coming out with, and your peers will help you in ways that you cannot even begin to imagine, all right? And a perfect example of this um, is really my ex-business partner. When we formed up, Right? I thought he had a bunch of JV contacts and I thought I had a bunch of JV contacts. Turns out one of us had a bunch of JV contacts and that was me. And I introduced him to my JV contacts, right? And my people that I work with, people I was in mastermind with and everything like that. After I fired him and dissolved the partnership, he continues to work with those people. So he got a built-in JV network from me, but then he took it upon himself to stay in contact with them, to work with them. And now a lot of those guys promote his products on a regular and frequent basis. His, the guy he hired for coaching, he met through me. Well, uh, to both of his big business partners, right, he met through me. But that's just an example of taking a relationship, building upon it, and turning it into profit. I mean, that's how you go from standing in a room with people that go, um, what do you mean you have a business partner? We thought you were making him up. I didn't even know the guy legally existed to being now considered by some to be an expert in Facebook marketing. So that's just kind of something to keep in mind. All right. So number three, and this one goes with a special shout out to Robert Stukes uh, for reminding me of this. Uh, and this is the thing that uh, I'm working on slowly, um, but working on diligently as well. And that is being meek or timid. You see, when I think back to my first getting into internet marketing, I was very aggressive. I was very to the point. I was very blunt. It was very in your face. I had an opinion. You were going to hear with it, uh, hear it. And if you didn't agree with it, you can kiss my ass and move on. Now, I have changed my strategy as I've grown and evolved as a human being, but that strategy alone was very, right, was very lucrative for me. It allowed me to push my way onto a stage in Raleigh, North Carolina, and then when I got on there, I was just me. I was, I was, I was not like, um, listen, I would like to talk to you guys today about uh, offline marketing and how boring, right? I was like, what, what's up? Let me tell you about how I almost got fired from this job. You see the cigar lounge? I worked there. I was upbeat. It was energy. I mean, imagine that this podcast with humor for 90 minutes. Bam, solid. I stood out, okay? I stood out from the crowd, from the audience. The problem is when we get timid or we get in our own head or we get shy and we don't want to shout to the rooftops about our products, our services, our projects, whatever it is. Now, just like with the JV relationships and just like everything on this list, there's a fine line because what tends to happen is a lot of people turn into the human spam and shitheads, right? Like I'm kind of sick of Facebook. I'm over Facebook. Because in my circle, the marketing circle, it seems like everybody's fucking screaming into uh, their handheld video recorder while they walk down the street talking about how you can change your life, you know, in between their, their fucking trips to Starbucks or whatever, right? Everyone's crushing it, making sales, swinging dicks, right? Everyone's just like, my life's fucking amazing and awesome. Right? No one ever goes and says, ah, oh, man, I had a shitty day today. Or, eh, today kind of kicked my ass. So here's what I, t uh, this is what my personal belief is. In 2014, it's important to be real and relevant. And I think it's important to see people in all shades, colors, right, and moods, opinions. It's okay to have a bad day. The fact that you have a bad day actually makes you more human and realistic than the guy that's like, every day I'm hustling, right? No, it's just my terrible attempt at whatever fucking worthless song that's ingrained in my brain thanks to Yo! MTV Raps, right? It's okay to brag, and you should brag when you have something that works, 
But I would tell you to temper that with being humble and gracious and being what I like to commonly refer to as a human being. So don't be a human piece of shit spam machine. Be a human being. But when you got a winner, when you got something that you want to tell the world about, you need to fucking roar. You need to be out there, you know, at the top of your lungs, beating that drum, saying, listen, right? This is what I need to do. I was talking to Robert earlier this week, and he said, you know what, Tim? He said, you know what the world needs? And I was like, what's that, Robert? He said, they need a Tim Castleman who doesn't give a fuck. And I'll be honest with you. I was like, you know what? That's exactly what the world is missing right there. But here's the thing, right? You got to do that, and you got to understand other people are going to judge you. Other people are going to hate on you. Other people are going to discourage you from taking your own path. Don't let them. Right? I got old coworkers that hate my fucking guts. I'm sure I got uh, friends. I may even have family members that don't really think too highly of what I'm doing and the life I live and all that stuff. And you know what? They can all eat my ass because they aren't me. They aren't responsible for the things I'm responsible for. And frankly, ain't any of them doing better than me. I saw this, uh, Ryan Schumann posted this the other day on Facebook. said, have you ever noticed that haters always are doing worse than you? Right? Richard Branson ain't calling me being like, hey, Tim Castleman, listen, man, I saw that Facebook video you did. Suck a dick. Right? You're terrible. Quit that. You fire. Whatever. It's always the people below you that are taking shots at you. So don't be meek. Okay? Roar when you have a chance to. But don't yell all the time. If you scream at the top of your lungs every time you talk... Eventually, people get used to that and it drowns it out. And here's the other thing. You know, it's kind of like you always got to constantly be raising that bar. If you're outrageous and in the face all the time, what do you got to do next to get someone's attention? And what do you have to do after that? So on and so forth. So roar when you need to roar. Get your word out there. But when you're not actively promoting a product or a service or telling the world how great your, you know, piece of shit lunch was, be a human being. Talk about occasionally things go wrong because things do go wrong in life and business. And people will relate to that and understand that much better than someone that's like, every day I'm hustling, right? And I'm just amazing and awesome and nothing ever bad can happen to me because those people are full of shit. And sadly, on Facebook, we see everybody's highlight reel instead of their real life. All right, let's keep rocking and rolling. Number two. And this is a cardinal sin. This is probably, well, I'm one of the worst offenders of this sin. And that is this, comparing yourself to others. I am the worst at this, okay? I am, I am preaching right next to you because I have not figured this out. I got some stuff I'm working on. I'll share it with you. Maybe it'll help you like it's helping me. But I am the fucking worst at this. I am in my head all the time, right? Let me give you an example of what I mean. Hey, man, had a good weekend promotion, made $2,000, holla. Oh, Tim, that's great. That's awesome. Dude, we did a weekend promotion, did $100,000. Now, they're not telling me that to make me feel bad about myself, but here's what I do. Man, I made $2,000. That's awesome. That's great. Oh, what? I'm sorry, huh? You made $100,000? I'm a worthless piece of shit. I can't believe it. Why did I ever get in this business? I'm terrible. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm stupid. Right? All that fucking tape plays all the time in my head. Why does it play it? Well, I mean, who plays it? I do. I hit the play button every time I compare myself to somebody else. It is a cancer that is eat you from the inside, right? It will eat you from the inside. It will cause you to call, have self-doubt and worry, pity, right? I mean, look, my business this month, because I took a lot of last month off, is struggling. Now, struggling is still five figures a month, but it's struggling compared to what we've done in the past. Here's the thing that I need to remember. Just a few short years ago, I had to get up, drive an hour to work, wear khakis and a, and a uh, polo shirt tucked in, you know, answer the damn phone, deal with pissed off people all day, drive an hour home, right, eat, eat a healthy choice meal or two, maybe go to the gym occasionally. If you've seen me recently, you know that's like really rare, right? And then read some Gary Halbert letters, go to sleep, you know, and be miserable. Now I get to travel. I get to do what I want. I have 
unsurpassed financial security that I've ever had before, right? I have a, a beautiful home. But it's hard to remember that when you're looking at someone else and what someone else is doing. You know, you may have just heard that list because I was saying the list. I was like, oh, so you know what? You're kind of being a douche here, Tim. I'm not saying that to impress, impress you, okay? But you may compare yourself to that list and be like, oh, well, I don't have a house. I don't have, uh, you know, financial security. I blah, 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 blah. It doesn't matter what you have and what I have. Here's all that matters. And here's what I'm working on for myself. And I hope that you work on it for you. All that matters is you. All you got to do is better your best. So yesterday I had a meeting with my accountant. I told him, I was like, man, Corey, you know, I was like, dude, things are awesome. And, you know, I mean, overall the year's going okay. But like this month I'm really stressing and it sucks. And, you know, I see the downward trend that you're talking about and blah, 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 blah. And then he goes, Tim, he said, let's look at your numbers compared to last year. And bam, wouldn't you know it, profit-wise, we had made more money than last year. Already five months into the, the year. And actually we made it by April, right? So we continue to every dollar I make today is one more dollar than I've ever made before profit wise. That's pretty freaking remarkable. That's something that's concrete and that I can measure. Only worry about yourself and only try to better your best because you're the only thing you can, can control. I can't control anything. The internet may shut down tomorrow. Who knows? Steve Jobs may get some type of zombie serum, pop out of his grave, and fucking shut this thing down. Hit the off switch, we're done. Who knows? All I know is what I can control. And all I know is this. This year, compared to last year, better than before. Compared to two years ago, oh my sweet Jesus, can't even begin to tell you how amazingly different and well my life is. But when we look at outside forces and sources and we go, well, why don't I have what they have? Why don't I have this? Why, 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 why? All it does is it creates self-doubt, negativity, makes us feel less. Nobody's ever like, oh, ha ha, that guy's doing 20 million, I'm doing 200,000. I feel so great about my life. It's a negative poison, poisonous cycle that we all go through, including myself. This is my biggest thing probably that I need to work on because I do this all the time, right? And it's okay to motivate yourself as long as it's motivating. But I have found for myself and for people I've talked to, when you compare yourself to other people, rarely is it motivating. And here's the other thing, you don't really know you don't know what the hell's going on in their life. It's like, yeah, they may have done a $100,000 promotion, but you know what? They're going through a divorce. Their kids fucking hate their guts. They're 500 pounds overweight, right? They have a crazy medical condition that causes their penis to shrink a foot every 12 hours. I, I don't know. You don't know, right? They have a strange addiction to clown porn. Who knows what's going on in the sick world of Dr. Ben Atkins, right? I have to say doctor because he is a respected chiropractor and you know I don't want to I don't want to I don't want to begrudge him in any way or take in any way any of the degree that he's earned you know the fact that he probably likes clown porn you know is really on him it's not me it's more him right kidding Ben thank you for all that you do you're an amazing business partner and friend okay so comparing yourself to others I do it all the time you got to stop the way you stop is you start comparing yourself to yourself right what did I weigh at the beginning of the month what did I weigh at the end concrete numbers not not what you think right it's like I'm a rap fan okay I grew up on the west coast during the west coast east coast beef I loved hip-hop because I went to an inner city school and that's all I got to listen to and it's amazing I love it I still listen to it to till this day Back in the day when they actually used to make videos and put them on MTV, you'd see the rappers with their blinged out wrist, right? All the ice and gold, the big fucking mansions, the, the cars, the private jets, the ladies, right? In some of their cases, the men, whatever. Go out two, three years after their last hit, most of them are filing bankruptcy. Most of them you find never had that money to begin with. Most of them were living paycheck to paycheck. I'm friends, or friendly, I should say, with a very popular... 90s band lead singer a rather large gentleman that plays the harmonica frequently that's all I'm going to say when I met him for the first time I asked him a foolish question and that foolish question was how do you like touring his retort to that was do you mean do I like to eat you see even though he had made millions during his career for whatever reason right they still had to tour and work to eat 
You don't know that. You don't know what's going on in anyone else's life but your own. And more importantly, you can't control what's going on. And instead of being jealous or envious or, or being down, you know what you should do? You should hook a player up, right? If, if someone's making big money, be happy for them. And I'm telling you, that's, I mean, I'm just being honest, that's tough for me. Because it's, you know, when you look inside yourself and you, you start coming up with all these reasons why you haven't achieved that level of success, the other thing you do is you start knocking that other person down to make you feel better about yourself. Well, that's bullshit, right? That, that doesn't do you any favors or do them any favors. What you should do is be like, hey, that's good for them. Congratulations. Oh, and look how well I'm doing. And guess what? If you're not doing well and you look at your numbers and you're not, use that as motivation to get your ass up, to get to work, to hook it up, and to make that money. Or build that relationship or write that book or whatever context this podcast finds you in. All right, and the number one thing that I see people fucking up in their business, and I've actually fixed this fuck up, but... I didn't until I had a great talk with my uh, friend Chris Winters, who said, well, how much of your business money and capital are you reinvesting into your business? And I was like, oh, Chris, that's an easy number to tell you. It's zero percent. Pause for drink. Delicious. What's not delicious is investing zero percent of your money back into your business. You see, when I got started, I was like, oh, man, I want to reinvest. I want to buy a new program. I want to get this piece of software. I want to attend this training. I want to go to a live event. I want to X. I want a Y. I want a Z. As I got more and more successful, I started subconsciously doing less and less of those things because I don't need to buy products anymore, right? I don't need to attend live events that much anymore. I've learned all I need to learn at the ripe age. At that time would have been 28. I've learned it all. I know it all. Uh, put some wax in my ears. I don't need to do anything. How foolish and stupid I was. How foolish and stupid I was. So what I started doing after that talk with Chris is I now reinvest 25% of all of my profits into my business. With the Kindle business, that means getting more books written even faster and faster than before. We went from like maybe a book a month to like eight books the first month that we did this. Why? Because I reinvested and I doubled down. You can also invest in, in resources. I love computers. I buy the fastest, best computer I can each and every year, and I don't feel bad about it because I'm investing in my success and my addiction. So it's a double win, all right? The other thing is, right, how about investing in software or staff? You, we can't do everything. That's a huge mess up a lot of people make too, right? They can't do everything. Oh, I'm going to be the best copywriter and the graphics person and the technical and the blah. And the, no, 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 no. You come up with a product, you talk to a copywriter, you talk to the graphics person, you talk to the tech guy, they'll make it all happen. You can't do that if you're not willing to reinvest in your business. I'll be honest with you. It's hard for me to invest in mentoring and coaching because of my ego. It just It's just one of those things. It's like, well, what do I need to learn from that person? I mean, sure, they've only done it 400 times better than me, but I mean, what could I learn? I mean, they want $5,000. Oh my God, that's a tremendous amount of money. Oh wait, it's not. I should have done it. The people I see level up in this business the quickest, I'm just being honest, and this is coming from someone that doesn't have a coaching program, unless you want to throw a bunch of money at me and then we could talk, right? Um, is people that do coaching. That's how they build new sales, uh, new, build new skills, make new sales, get invited to more JV contacts. I mean, you got to buy yourself into the room. And I think that's important and critical for you to do when you're ready and have an existing business. If you're just getting started, yeah, maybe some mentorings for you. But if you're not getting started and, and you're struggling or you're hitting a wall or a plateau, invest in a mentor and a coach. Even if it's just a one-hour call. Hell, give me 250 bucks. I'll talk to you for an hour, right? That's most people's mantra or 500 or 1,000 or whatever. Invest, get in the room, right? Invest in your business, invest in your life. Another thing I'll recommend that you do, and uh, I had a friend tell me this and I, I thought it was really smart, was invest in your family. For a lot of you guys, you're like, well, my spouse is so unsupportive of what I do. I don't get it. I mean, all I do is spend every waking second on the computer. I buy a bunch of products. I don't do very much with them. The ones that I do, I get limited success. And then I take that money and I buy me some more products. 
Now, I think that's great that you're reinvesting. Here's what I think is a smarter thing. Hey, you know what? I made some money. I'm going to take 25% of that, and I'm going to invest that in my wife or my spouse. I'm going to take them to a fancy meal. Right? I'm going to buy them a little trinket uh, to show them that I love them and I appreciate that I support them. Back when I was working and working towards freedom, I used to take my wife to lunch once a week. When the bill came, I'd say, hey, I got it. I'm going to put this on the business account. The business has this. What am I doing there? One, I'm paying for lunch. Awesome. Yeah, great. Two, I'm reinforcing. My business makes money, and because my business makes money, we get to do this cool little fun thing called going out to eat on a regular basis, and it's taking care of it. It's not coming out of our money. It's coming out of the business money. So I highly, highly recommend that you reinvest in your business and your relationships. Now listen, these are the five things that most people, including myself, fuck up in their business. Maybe this isn't your list. Then do what I did. Sit down and go, what am I fucking up on my business? And write everything down. It took me approximately two minutes to write uh, a page and a half worth of, of things that I'm screwing up in my business. Now, I did it with a Sharpie and blah, blah, blah. Okay? Then I just said, all right, well, what are the top five? All right, what are they from five to one? Now I got a path. Now I got stuff I got to work on in and outside of my business. It really is that simple. And if you do it and you work through that list, you're going to find out tremendous results. You're also probably going to find out that once one problem goes away, another one reappears. That's okay. That's all about life. Okay? Life is all about getting over one hurdle to get over the next and the next and the next. You stop getting over hurdles, you got a problem. So that's it. I appreciate your time and attention on the Two Drink Tim podcast. Again, I'm going to remind you one last time. Please go to timreallylikes.com slash Lisa. Do me a favor. If you've enjoyed this podcast, throw a little bit of money her way. Help her out of a really tough situation. No matter what you decide to do, I appreciate you listening each and every week. And I promise I'll do a better job of hopefully getting next week's episode out in time. But my wife is coming home this weekend. So... It might be, you know, might have to get her double pregnant this weekend. Who knows? All right, y'all. Be well. Talk to you soon.